Thank you for reading the scripture for us, Charles. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor David Bird, and I'm going to be here for the next 90 days. So it's good to be back. We were here for the, oh, wow. I hope you're still applauding after the message today. <laughs> so it is a joy to be with you. And uh, give us a few weeks to get all of your names. We're working on it again. And then we have guests who have come here today, and we want to welcome you to uh, a friendly place where God is alive and Jesus Christ is being glorified. I want you to turn in the scriptures to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at the first eight verses today, but we're going to study the book of Colossians over the next three months. So you can read through it a time or two or take one chapter a week and read through it or however you want to do that. But we're going to work our way through this book of Colossians. And there are two words I want you to think about this morning. The word thankfulness and prayer. So as we start our study of Colossians, these two words are repeated often. Thankfulness and prayer. And usually our thankfulness leads into prayer or our prayer leads into thanksgiveness or thankfulness. Now Paul... <clears throat> is writing to this church in Colossae, there's some sort of strange teaching that has come about, and we'll discover more about that in a few weeks. And he starts writing this letter, and he could have started writing to them in a judgmental, criticizing way. He could have started this letter by saying, what's wrong with you people? What in the world are you up to? You're falling for all sorts of nonsense, and here I am in prison. I don't have time for this. Straighten up. Get your act together. But that's not how Paul starts his letter. He starts with thankfulness. He, thought, he starts with prayer. Now, I do want you to understand that Paul was in prison when he was writing this letter to the Colossians. This past December... We were in uh, Germany working with another church, and we went with some church leaders and his family to Rome. Now, if you've been to Rome, and some of you are here from Rome, there are a lot of things to see in Rome. But there was one thing I really wanted to see. I wanted to see the prison where Paul and Peter were held. And so we went to the Mamertine prison. It was created about... 200 years before Paul was even born. It's uh, probably the size of this stage, and it's down in a dungeon, and the only way to get into this prison, there's a hole in the upper floor, and they would let the prisoners down through this hole. And it was very dark there. It'd be very solitary if you were by yourself, or if there were lots of prisoners, which I'm sure there was, it was very um, difficult to be around that many people. All your food, everything was taken in and out through this hole where the guards were. There was no escape from this prison. And so Paul was incarcerated there for preaching the gospel. That's where he received information. It's where he received correspondence. It's where he wrote a letter and sent it back out from. So Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter we're going to study. And he had never even met these people. Imagine that. He'd never even been to their city. He had nothing to do with starting the church at Colossae. He didn't know who these people were, but he got information about them. And the information he got, it called him to be thankful for what he heard and to pray for them to continue in their journey for Jesus Christ. So even though he could not visit them personally, he springs into action and he begins to write this letter of encouragement and to teach them in the faith. You know what? I believe if Paul were alive today and he wrote a letter to IBC Munich, we'd feel pretty special, don't you think? Yeah, we'd be humbled, but we'd be very honored. I mean, imagine getting an, a letter from some important Christian who has never been to Munich, never been to this church, but you got a letter from them saying, hey, I've heard about what you're doing, 
And I just want to bless you, and I want to encourage you. I have a group of supporters. They're not famous Christians. They're famous to me. They've never been to Munich. They've never met you. But uh, they have sent some encouraging words. I want to share with some of them uh, what they said. They said, uh, David, we're praying for the church that God has assigned you to. We're excited and wishing we could be there with you, but we'll continue to pray for his glory to overwhelm the hearts of this congregation and light a holy fire in Munich. I love that. Somebody else from my prayer team said, Father, fill David with your spirit to preach your word this morning. May your spirit so fill the room that there is a tangible unity within the Munich congregation and unleash a mighty revival this day for your glory. Paul, writing a letter of encouragement to people he doesn't even know, and you and I can do the same thing. So there's a few things I want to share with you from these first eight verses, things that we can be thankful for and about. Number one, we can thank God the Father because he can use you and me the same way that he used Paul and Timothy. Notice in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Paul was appointed by Jesus Christ himself to be an apostle. It was according to God's will. God had a particular ministry for Paul to perform in this world. Timothy had a particular ministry. Now, Timothy found faith in Christ through his family, but he was discipled by Paul. He was mentored by Paul. Well, I want you to know that you and I this morning, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we are usable by the will of God. And the more time we spend with God, the more we entrust to God, the more he is going to use us. So I want to challenge all of our believers to, to take a day out of the week. Maybe a Saturday or Sunday, you, you go for a walk in the park or uh, at your lunch break from work, you, you go out and walk. Just do a little prayer walking. And just ask the Lord this as you're walking around. Might there be someone, Lord, that you would want me to engage with in a conversation? Now, don't force it. Don't go out there and go, man, I'm going to do something for God. You'll fall flat on your face. Just go out there and be, be open for what God's going to do. And it may be that God doesn't lead you to have a conversation with anyone. He may just want you to have a conversation with him. But be aware to do those things. So you're, you're walking in the park like I, Brenda and I were walking in the park. You hear somebody speaking English. That kind of perks my ears up. That could be the person that God is leading you to. Maybe they need assistance in directions, or maybe you need assistance for directions, or you'd like to know where they got that ice cream. But just start a conversation and see if anything happens. And it may well lead to a conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ or an invitation to this church. Now, again, don't force it, but the Holy Spirit will bring you to someone. We were walking the other night, and there was a young lady in front of us. She, she had cowboy boots on. Now, I noticed cowboy boots because I'm from Texas. In fact, I should have brought my boots. And so as we walked by, I said, I like your boots. And I said, we are from Texas. And she just kind of grinned. It was kind of a little bashful. And there was no conversation be made, you know. So that was it. And she probably went back to her apartment thinking, who was that crazy guy talking about my boots, you know. Oh. Uh, we uh, were eating a meal last night at a restaurant, and I could hear English next to me, some young students. And after a while, I finally just said, hey, I said, what nationalities are y'all from? Oh, we're from, what was it, Poland, Italia, Italy, uh, Romania, and I, I didn't hear what the other one was. And we just had a brief conversation. Nothing spiritual happened. It could have. But you just go out and just say, God, if you want to use me, use me. So I know that after our service today, we have a fellowship. And uh, before the, the fellowship, for about 15 minutes, Brother John's got a little class because we're going to do an outreach next week. And, 
and he will show you how to just comfortably share the gospel with someone if it comes up in the conversation. So, you know, God can use you just as he used Paul and Timothy, and we don't have to be in a prison to be used. Second thing is we can thank God for fellow believers who are faithful. Paul writes in verse 2, I'm writing to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. So thank the Lord for faithful believers who inspire you because there's many and they were a blessing to Paul even though he didn't know who they were. Because when we are faithful, God will use us to encourage others with grace and peace. And we have grace and peace when we are faithful. And those days when we're not walking to the Lord, we're unfaithful, we lose our peace. But God's compassion is fresh every day. He wants us to be in a close relationship with him. And he desires for us to be faithful to him. So maybe we need to just set aside those things that would cause us to be unfaithful. Some of those things are good things. It could be our hobbies, it could be movies, it could be music, it could be images, it could be sports, it could be games. I love playing games on my phone. But sometimes I need to be doing something much different, you know, than playing games on my phone. So let us give our hearts and our mind to God so that we can always be faithful. I'm always inspired by fellow believers who are faithful. I love the verses that Charles read for us while ago from Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. I want to read those again. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, we've got all these witnesses around us, let us also lay aside everything that encumbers us, lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, isn't that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it's important for us to give thanks for fellow believers who are faithful. They encourage us. Number three, of course, we want to be thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes to them and says, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He gives thanks to God for Jesus Christ, and that automatically leads him into praying for the other people. Now, a lot of people in this world have various ideas about who Jesus is, but Jesus is always a magnet. He's always drawing people to study him and to come in faith with him. I, I find it very amusing. Nearly every old rock and roll band has some song about Jesus. Then they may not believe that he's the son of God, but there's something about Jesus that draws them that they can't figure out completely who he is, but they'll write a song about him. Is he a man or is he the son of God? And for Paul and many of us here, we have decided he's the savior of those who believe. He died for our sins. He took upon himself the payment of our sin so that he can make a way for us in heaven. So we give thanks to God for Jesus Christ, but it leads us to praying for other people. So Paul, imagine him, he's, he's in this prison, he's hearing about this church, he's praising God for them, and now he begins to pray for them. And it causes him to write a letter. You know, when you pray for people, it's maybe a good thing to just give them a little text, send them a little email, say, I don't know why, but this morning you came to mind. I just want you to know I prayed for you. I hope you have a strong day. And you never know how helpful those things are to the person who receives them, right? Everyone needs prayer. Everyone needs encouragement. I was thinking the other day about the pastor that I grew up under, the pastor where I came to faith in Christ, the pastor who encouraged me to, to look into a call to become a pastor. I hadn't talked to him in four or five years. I just called him out of the blue. He's, he's very old now. His memory is slipping. He knew who I was, but I just wanted to call and tell him how much he meant to me. And uh, he, he invited me to come see him. He couldn't remember where he lives, but he invited me to come see him. So I need to find out where he lives. And the next time in the States, maybe I can go actually see him. 
Number four, we give thanks to God for believers who have faith and love for others. Paul says, since we, we, we thank God, we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love that you have for all the saints. So he says, I, I'm thankful because of the faith I've heard that you have, and I'm thankful for the love that you have for all the saints. Maybe we need to work on our love for all the saints. That's interesting that he says all the saints you know, sometimes there are people who are difficult to love. Would you agree with that? Don't look at them if you're sitting next to them, okay? If you're husband and wife. <laughs> Have you discovered there's always a few people, even in church, that your personalities are just different or you come at things a little bit different? But someone has to love them and love us enough to keep praying for us is there someone that maybe you avoid is there someone you've stopped praying for or caring for i we'd be willing to bet here at ibc munich there are people who over covid or for whatever reasons have dropped out of church and maybe they just need to be contacted maybe they just need a a little phone call from someone who loves them and cares for them Paul is thankful for their faith and this great love that they have for all the saints. Fifth thing to be thankful for is the hope in heaven. He says, we're thankful because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So we have the hope. Isn't that interesting? Because he's up to this point talked about your faith, your love, but he doesn't say your hope. It's your faith. I'm thankful for your faith. I'm thankful for your love for all the saints, but I'm thankful for not your hope, but the hope. There's a reality to this hope, the word of truth, the gospel. This hope is true. You know, we meet people, and, and some of them aren't sure about eternity and, and afterlife. Some might even say, well, I'm not sure there's an afterlife. Or some will even say, I don't think there is an afterlife. But, you know, eternity is not something a person chooses to believe or not. It just is. It's the hope. The hope that we have. And we have this hope reserved in heaven and i think it's talking about the hope being jesus christ himself the message of good news the salvation that's quite a hope number six we're to be thankful for the truth which is bearing fruit the gospel it's a fruit bearing gospel this truth notice in verse five it says he says because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, this gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the days you heard of it and understood the grace of God's truth. See, this gospel message is increasing. It's growing throughout the world. You and I, we tend to only see all the bad stuff in the world because that's all that we see on the news, all the awful stuff. And we don't always see the powerful way God is moving in this world, but he is. And Christ is drawing people to himself from every nation, from every race, from every culture. He's drawing them in from every kind of sin that they're involved in. He's drawing them to salvation. Now, there's something very unique about Christianity and the church. It is the most inclusive thing there is. Now, most people say the church is not inclusive. I beg to disagree. Now, we are not morally inclusive of everything. There is right, there is wrong. But you think about all the world religions, 
Christianity just stands above and beyond it all because of who Christ is. If you were to go to a Muslim worship service today, get in your mind what that service would look like. The building would look similar to all mosques. The people inside would be dressed the same. And whether this service was in Iran or France or the U.S. or Japan, the building itself would look alike. The people inside would look alike. If you were to go to a Jewish temple or synagogue, the people inside would, would look alike. They would dress alike. But it's not true with Christianity. You know, the church in America will look quite different from the church in South Korea or India or Africa. The buildings would look different. The dress would be completely different. The songs would be different. The music would be different. Faith in Jesus Christ transcends all of culture, and God is creating a unique, diverse kingdom of God. It's quite amazing. I noticed when we were trying to clap all ago in the music, which I hope we, we get the clapping down. We might need clapping lessons, Brother Farami. Because some cultures clap on the first beat. One, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Other cultures, it's on the second beat. One, two, three, four. And I'm going, okay, which way are we going here? I think this church is a one, two, three. I think this is an odd one, okay? But we're going to have to get our clapping together because it's different everywhere. The gospel produces the most inclusive fruit of any religion. And that truth is increasing, it's growing, it's reaching into every tribe, into every nation. Again, we are not morally inclusive. The scriptures tell us what is acceptable to God, what grieves God, what brings his wrath. But I encourage us to have eyes to see the growing kingdom of God. And the seventh thing is we need to pray or be, give thanks for people who share the gospel with us. Verse 7 and 8, Paul now mentions a person. And this person is the one who apparently went to this city and preached and people received Christ as Savior. His name's Epaphras. He says, just as you learned this gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. So he mentions Epaphras. We don't know much about him. I'll talk more about him as we go through this study of Ephesians. But he's the person who shared salvation with them. Paul didn't know any of these people. They learned the gospel from Epaphras. The gospel is spread from one human being to another human being through people like Epaphras, who are faithful servants of Christ. Those of you who are believers this morning, from whom did you learn the gospel? Who taught you the gospel? Who was a major influence on you? Who mentored or discipled you? And you might ask the question, who have you discipled? So in conclusion for today, I want you to remember that God can use you. God has a ministry for you. And we need to thank people who are faithful, who have loved us, who shared hope with us, the gospel. And maybe let them know this week, because everyone needs encouragement. And I want you to remember that the kingdom of God is growing. And he wants to include you. Would you be willing to turn from your sin and receive Christ as your Savior? God wants to include you. He doesn't want to include your sin. He wants to free you from your sin and set you on a journey of righteousness and you are welcome to come into his kingdom today i'm going to have a prayer in a moment and we're going to have a song and i'm going to stand here if you'd like to come and receive christ or come and 
receive prayer or just come and kneel at the altar. This is, this is a coming forward church, okay? Don't let it be a shock if someone comes forward. We need to be in the habit of it. And I just want you to know that I'll be here for the next three months. I'd love to sit down with any of you and talk to you about any spiritual questions that you have, particularly questions about salvation. No pressure on you, but if there's some stirring going on in your heart, chase it while those stirrings are there. The only thing I ask you is don't wait till the very last week I'm here and say, hey, I'd like to have coffee with you. We got 90 days. Let's don't wait. Let's talk about the things of God. Let's talk about questions. Let's talk about confusion. Let's talk about the gospel. So let me pray for you. Pray for all of us. And then let me give you a chance to make a decision for the Lord today. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. We're thankful for people who've gone before us, people who are still alive, who have been a blessing to us and encouraging to us, people who've shared the gospel with us, people who encourage us, people who are kind to us. And Lord, may we also be engaged in those kinds of things. So Lord, set us free. Set us free from our sins. Set us free from anything that would hold us back from following you and you completely. For this we pray in the name of Jesus, the one and only Savior. Amen.